Hello class, this is Pei Zhang. In this presentation, we'll be covering common medical genres. Again, we'll be taking this information from the textbook Translation Practices Explained, Medical Translation Step-by-Step, -step, Learning by Drafting, authors are Vincent Montalt Bresorexio and Maria Gonzalez Davis. As we have seen, written medical communication in formal context is carried out through well-established genres. Researching medical genres and getting to know them well, their communicative purpose, the situations where they are used, their participants' motivations and expectations, and their typical structure and form is a key to successful medical translation. In this presentation, we look at some medical genres as examples of what the medical translator normally has to deal with in professional practice. In particular, we look at the following, fact sheets for patients, informed consent, patient information leaflets, summary of product characteristics, clinical guidelines, and case report. The Fact Sheets for Patients, or FSP. Patient education is a critical factor not only in controlling and hopefully overcoming a particular disease or condition, but also in preventing it. Traditionally, the only source of information for patients has been the doctor in the context of the consulting room. This is no longer the case. In the era of the Internet and of the democratization of medical knowledge, patients have access to quality information about their disease. Being well informed enables them to contribute to their own health and well-being. An FSP, also referred to as patient leaflets or patient information brochure, is normally issued by a health organization, a local, national, or international government body, a patient's association, a professional association, a research institute, a hospital, or a medical society. It is intended to provide patients with the main and most relevant information about a particular disease or condition, symptoms, causes, treatment, medicine, diagnostic procedures, and so forth. FSPs are normally written by health professionals in such a way that patients and their relatives can understand the context of the text. The information they contain often comes from highly reliable, well-established medical information sources, such as clinical handbooks, revision articles, and medical textbooks. In other words, FSPs are re-elaborations and re-contextualizations of previous texts belonging to more specialized genres. FSPs presents information in an easy-to-read, concise way. Hence, the headings of the different sections express succinctly the most relevant aspects of the disease. These are organized hierarchically, starting from the most basic ones, such as defining the disease and its causes, to presenting the most recent research being done and outlining some of the findings published in international research journals. So, how would you transform a manual for physicians into a fact sheet for patients? First, you will probably have to do some research on concepts and terms that you are not familiar with. Then, you will decide which information you will select for a fact sheet for patients of this text. Then you will decide how you are going to present the specialized terms so that your reader will understand them. So first, you might want to de-terminologize the text, take out a lot of the high register terminology. Then you are going to draft it, selecting the particular genre, and then you will write your FSP in your target language by choosing the structure that best suits the communicative needs of your target reader. Now let's look at an informed consent, or IC. The informed consent fulfills two main purposes. On the one hand, it can be used to express a patient's written consent to a surgical or medical procedure or other course of treatment, given after the physician has explained the potential benefits and risks and discussed any possible alternative treatment. The concept of informed consent is based on the principle that a physician has a duty to disclose to patients information that allows them to make a reasonable decision regarding their own treatment. On the other hand, an informed consent is also required for participation in clinical studies. Experimentation on human being is a key aspect for the progress of medical research. New drugs, procedures, and techniques can only be fully validated if they have been tested on people. 
In the course of recent history, however, experimentation on humans has been immorally abused. The judgment by the War Crimes Tribunal at Nuremberg laid down ten principles known as the Nuremberg Code, to which physicians must conform when carrying out experiments on human subjects. The first principle of this code states the following: the voluntary consent of the human subject is absolutely essential. This means that the person involved should have legal capacity to give consent, should be so situated as to be able to exercise free power of choice. Without the intervention of any element of force, fraud, deceit, or duress, overreaching, or other ulterior form of constraint or coercion, and should have sufficient knowledge and comprehension of the elements of the subject matter. Likewise, one of the basic principles of the Declaration of Helsinki, adopted by the 18th World Medical Association General Assembly, states that in any research on human beings. Each potential subject must be adequately informed of the aims, methods, source of funding, and possible conflicts of interest. The subject should be informed of the right to abstain from participation in the study, or to withdraw consent to participate at any time without reprisal. These two legal texts clearly state the main purpose of the informed consent: that a person, when asked to participate in a clinical study, Can exercise free power of choice based on knowledge and comprehension of the elements of the subject matter involved. For example, if you have a research need, you need to do a clinical trial protocol first. You will need an informed consent for the clinical trial protocol, and also during the clinical trial, you should develop an original article reporting the clinical trials. A consent form written in a language too technical or containing jargon will be deemed incomprehensible and intimidating for a potential participant. We must take effort to write for the intended audience by using language appropriate for the participant's age group and educational background, and use lay language when possible. With regard to structure and types of information, an informed consent has two main parts. The first part is informative and contains details about the study. The second part consists of the consent itself, that is, the authorization. Although different organizations adapt the format of the IC to their particular needs, the informative part of most IC usually contains the following: the background, nature, justification, and purpose of the study, the institutional affiliations of the researchers. The institutions that promote the study, the method and means by which the study is to be conducted, the specific participation required of the patient, the discomfort and risk to be expected, the benefits to be expected from the study, the availability of medical treatment, the opportunity to withdraw at any time, and information about insurance and about confidentiality. As far as the second part is concerned, the key element is the authorization, that is, the signature of the person giving consent, which is typically written in the first person singular. In the signature section, there is usually a clear statement that the document is signed on condition that the subject may withdraw at any time. It is also stated that the person signing has read carefully and understood all the particulars of the study. A witness to the signature of the documents is normally required. When the participants of the study are children, their parents' signatures are required. Now for the patient information leaflets, or PILs. If you have ever been prescribed a medicine or bought an over-the-counter medicine, you will probably be familiar with this genre. The patient information leaflets, also called information leaflets or package insert. Is the document enclosed in the outer sales package of a medicinal product, and is written in the national language of the country where it's sold? PILs are issued by pharmaceutical companies in accordance with the requirements of drug regulatory agencies. Here in the United States is the FDA. In Europe is the EMEA. PILs are summarized and simplified versions of longer, more complex documents addressed to experts. That are produced for the development and approval of medicines. The content of the package leaflets must be consistent with the SPC 
or summary of product characteristics, but in a wording that can be easily understood by non-professionals. In the case of the European Union, drugs dossiers published by the EMEA have to contain summaries of product characteristics addressed to the prescribers, as well as information relevant to the patients. After the doctor has prescribed the medicine, the patient alone is responsible for taking it as directed, that is, in a safe and effective way. Safety and efficacy depend not only on the indications and contraindications of the medicine. It is the doctor's decision which medicine a particular patient needs, but also on taking it exactly as prescribed. Taking more or less medicine than prescribed, or taking it under certain circumstances, may be a cause for concern. So we'll usually see information on the dosage. The name of the product is usually at the beginning of the leaflets. You will find the pharmaceutical form in which the medicine is prepared for human use. It can be tablets, syrups, aerosol, capsules, and so forth. The marketing authorization holder. They will usually have information on the composition of the medical product, the qualitative and quantitative composition. They will have information as far as the characteristics, a description of the properties of the medicine, indications, the use of the medicine. For example, it's used for high blood pressure or it's used to treat people after a heart attack. They will have a listing of the contraindications. It usually will state who should not take the medicine. That might be children, the elderly, pregnant women, nursing mothers, etc. It will have undesirable effects. These are normally listed in decreasing order of seriousness, and also interactions, so effects of other products, not only other medicines but also food or alcohol if relevant. Special warnings and precautions. This section may contain information about the influence of the drug on the patient's behavior, also whether or not they're able to drive, and also the sizes of the package and how to store the package, whether it needs to be stored in a refrigerator or on a shelf at room temperature, as well as the date of the last revision. The PIL's technical terms are often accompanied by explanations or even simply avoided. In order to enable patients to understand the concepts better, owing to marketing strategies, multinational companies sometimes sell their products with different trade names in different countries. Therefore, we should check whether the medicine is commercialized with the same trade name in target marketplace. It is also important for medical translators to bear in mind that some countries prefer using national nomenclatures instead of the international one recommended. In order to comply with regulations on the accessibility of PILs brought in recently in some countries, pharmaceutical companies are starting to offer PILs in braille and other forms. So let's compare some PILs in different languages and from different companies. So here's an exercise that you can do: choose a medicine that you've recently used or simply one that you're familiar with. Read the PIL in your target language. Then find the PILs for the same medicine in other language or languages that you use as a translator. Compare the texts. Are there any differences in structure, headings, style, tenor, and terminology? Now look for the PILs in your target language for four medicines commercialized by four different companies. Compare them, asking the following questions. Are there any differences in symbols, visual elements, structure, headings, or style? Which of them is the clearest and most readable, and why is that? Now let's look at the summary of product characteristics, or SPCs. In order to commercialize any medicine, one of the documents attached to every application for marketing authorization is the proposal for a summary of product characteristics. The SPC, together with a package leaflet, constitute Part One B of the dossier, which is required by the authorities. This document summarizes the main characteristics of a medical product from different points of view: pharmacological, chemical, pharmaceutical, toxicological, and so forth. The SPC fulfills yet another communicative purpose. It is the basis of information for health professionals on how to use the medicinal product safely and effectively. 
So some of the information that you will have on an SPC is trade name of the medicinal product, qualitative and quantitative composition, the pharmaceutical form, clinical particulars such as the therapeutic indications, contraindications, special warnings, effects on ability to drive, undesirable effects, pharmacological properties, pharmaceutical particulars such as a list of excipients, shelf life, nature of the container, etc. The marketing authorization holder, the data for authorization, and the date of revision. The above mentioned guide on the SPC specifies some norms that are useful for the translator, such as what is the international non proprietary name that should be used? The use of decimal points should be avoided, where these can easily be removed. For safety reasons, micrograms should always be spelled in full. The pharmaceutical form should be described in standard term. The active substance should be referred to by its recommended name, accompanied by salt or hydrate form if relevant. Reading this guide is strongly recommended. It provides us with the norms and criteria that will enable us to make better decisions in the translation process. So what's the difference between a PIL and an SPC? You can compare these by looking at the different product information checklists, as well as the product package leaflets. Compare the two genres and explore the differences between them. What information has been added in the PIL? What information has been omitted? Are the headings for sections the same in both cases? How is specialized terminology presented? Who are the main users of this particular document? What are its main aims? How many different genres can you identify? Are all of them addressed to the same readership? And now let's look at the case report, or CR. The case report is arguably the oldest and most basic form of communication in medicine. Depending on the research journals where they are published, or the educational or clinical context in which they are produced, CRs are also known as clinical case reports, or clinical case studies. A case report is typically written by a clinician to describe and discuss an instance of a disease in a single patient. The communicative purpose of CR is threefold. First, to share relevant clinical information with other clinicians and help them improve their clinical practice. Second, to stimulate further research in a particular field or on a specific issue. And third, to teach medical students how to approach complex clinical practice in an efficient way. CRs normally describe or illustrate an aspect of the condition, the treatment, and the adverse reactions to treatment. CRs are typically expository texts, that is, there is little or no argumentation or instruction. Let's look at this example. HL is a 46-year-old Afro-American female, with a past medical history significant for hypothyroidism and beta-thalassemia, who was otherwise healthy until two weeks prior to admission. At that time, she noted onset of a sore throat, malaise, and low-grade fevers. Four days prior to admission, she experienced a fever of 104 degrees Fahrenheit, chills, nausea, and vomiting, and arthralgias and myalgias. She presented to the John Hopkins Bayview Medical. According to the CR, we see that the facts are narrated and objects described so that the reader can easily form a mental image of them and understand them. They contain primary information that is, hitherto unpublished material. And in this sense, they contribute to the scientific research by providing new, up-to-date information very rapidly. However, it is considered to be a weak type of research since it is supported by the evidence of just one single example. The CR has its origin in medical teaching. In the 19th century, Clinical teaching gradually shifted from lectures accounting for disease by theories and classifications more speculative than factually verified to bedside analysis cases. What is of critical importance is helping the reader, a medical student or another clinician to recognize and deal with a similar problem should one present itself in the future. Green Health provides a typical situation in which a case report can be needed to satisfy communicative needs. 
A doctor notices that two babies born in his hospital have absent limbs, which is phocomelia. Both mothers have taken a new drug, thalidomide, in early pregnancy. The doctor wishes to alert his colleagues worldwide to the possibility of drug-related damages as quickly as possible. Basically, the reader of a CR must have a clear understanding of what happened to the patient, the sequence of events, and the time scale involved, and why management followed the lines that it did. Although different research journals have their own norms as far as structure and length of CRs, most published CRs have the following sections: the title, the authors, the introduction, background or literature review, the case description, including the case history, examination and intervention, the outcome, the discussion and the summary. From the point of view of information flow, CRs may contain data from the patient's medical record that help the reader to understand the present condition. In turn, CRs directly or indirectly provide information to more systematic and sophisticated scientific work, such as case series, case control studies, cohort studies, randomized control studies, double-blind studies, systematic reviews, and meta-analysis.